Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. For the faculty summit, and uh, he requested for us to make some uh, serendipitous connections with researchers around Microsoft. Um, Brad's reputation precedes him, but as a quick overview, he's been a HCI researcher for many years at uh, at MIT and at um, uh, and at Xerox Park, and um, most recently at Carnegie Mellon University. And in fact, the exciting thing uh, recently this year is that Brad has been um, uh, was recognized as a member of the Chi Academy, which is uh, a recognition of his extensive contributions to the field of human-computer interaction, over 250 publications, in fact, uh, which is really, really exciting. So uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different than his previous talks uh, in its nature, in the sense that uh, we're going to cover a wide range of different things, and in fact, he's going to cover a little bit of a different scope of things. So in the past, we've really focused on HCI and on some of the research that we've collaboratively done or that we funded from Microsoft, and he's done um, at CMU. But in fact, this talk, we wanted to kind of broaden the scope and talk about some of the work he's done uh, with programming and debugging, as well as focus on some of his interesting things for, uh, for uh, knowledge worker productivity and HCI. So without any more delay, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Brett Marsh. Thanks, John. Well, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, and I'm hoping to get to talk to you uh, about all the interesting things you're doing here, which is the main reason I come by. Uh, but I'm always happy to talk about uh, the stuff that we're doing. And as John said, uh, I was asking him, you know, what I should talk about uh, on this trip, that uh, the Pebbles Project that John's been supporting for many years, we didn't have too much new on. Uh, but we were doing this really exciting work on some other areas, and I asked him which one he was interested in. He said, all of them, just like his usual enthusiastic self. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to try and cram all these talks into, uh, into an hour. Uh, the Citrine work uh, is brand new, and this is stuff we're going to be presenting at WIST, and this is uh, the first place we're ever presenting it. Uh, the Y-Line uh, work uh, we just presented at CHI. Uh, it's also some new results. Uh, and Edge, Wright, and Pebbles I've talked about here a little bit uh, before, and last year, and so forth, but uh, this is uh, some new parts as well. So let's get right on, on to it. Uh, so Citrine is uh, this idea that we've had uh, to uh, work on uh, Smart Clipboard, and this is work that I've done uh, with uh, some students, Jeff Stylos and uh, Lawrence Lee. And uh, all of this work, by the way, that I'm going to be presenting, there's uh, often there's free downloads, there's lots of papers and so forth, so if you're interested, there's certainly a lot more information uh, that I won't have time to cover. Uh, the idea of Citrine is to basically extend the copy and paste metaphor with some AI, and uh, this is part of the uh, large-scale radar project that CMU uh, has been engaged by DARPA to do. Uh, it was partially instigated by uh, Eric Horvitz here, who uh, inspired uh, DARPA to uh, start this initiative. Uh, the idea is to take some of the machine learning uh, technologies that have uh, been uh, created and try and apply them to the kind of conventional office tasks that we all spend so much time uh, and annoying, uh, anno wasting uh, a lot of time doing. And so the copy and paste uh, Metaphor we, or interaction technique we found that you know it's very ubiquitous, but it's still pretty tedious. And so we were looking at to see if we could use some of these AI techniques to uh, augment it in different ways. And so what we're doing is uh, we parse. If you copy plain text, then it uh, tries to parse it uh, using some parsers, and we have both kind of uh, simple ad hoc parsers as well as some sophisticated learning parsers. It takes the structured information from what's it's interpreted on the uh, stack on the uh, clipboard, and then uh, provides the structured information in a way that you can then paste it into new applications in new ways. Um, and we have plugins for Internet Explorer, for Outlook, uh, Excel, the Palm Desktop, uh, EndNote, which is a bibliographic reference database. Uh, as well as uh, virtually all other applications. Because it works with the regular copy and paste mechanism, uh, it basically enables you to connect to uh, virtually any application at all. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with any of my old work, you know that most of them are silly acronyms, and Citrine is no exception. It stands for Clipboard Interaction Techniques that Recognize Information Such as Names and Events. <laughs> and Citrine, in case you don't know, is this gemstone. Uh, it's a kind of yellow quartz. And, uh, if you're really interested, uh, there's a long 
list of other silly acronyms on my website. Uh, so let's, um, there's a question already. Um, let's go to the video. And uh, I, since I'm trying to cram so much into such a little talk, I just decided to play the video because that's faster than I can Citrine do Citrine is a new tool that augments the standard copy and paste interaction technique with many new functions. Normally, when you copy a block of text that contains structured information, like an address, you cannot paste it into the Palm Desktop Address Book, the Card Stand Address Book, or the Netscape Address Book. If I can make that bigger. If you paste into the Outlook Address Book, all of the text goes into the Notes field, and then you must laboriously copy each piece of information into the right place. Similarly, when you copy some text containing a bibliographic reference, you cannot paste it into a reference database such as EndNote, except by laboriously copying it field by field. In contrast, when Citrine is running, it automatically checks each time the clipboard gets new content to see if it can recognize the format. If so, Citrine adds new formats to the clipboard, which enable pasting into the appropriate applications. The Citrine icon in the window tray changes to show the kind of information that Citrine has detected. And optionally, Citrine will briefly pop up a notification showing what has been inferred. When Citrine detects a contact or an address, it adds formats to the clipboard that enable pasting into the Palm Desktop, Card Scan, and many other programs. When pasting into Outlook, all the fields are now filled in. When you copy a bibliographic reference, Citrine parses it and adds the EndNote format to the clipboard so you can now paste a new entry directly into EndNote. The Palm calendar does not support copying or pasting of events at all. Citrine provides a special button to allow an event to be copied. Also, when you copy some plain text containing an event, such as a meeting or talk announcement, Citrine will recognize it, and a special button will paste the event into the Palm calendar. In the Outlook calendar, when you copy an event, it just copies the subject and not the time. For pasting events without Citrine, you must navigate to the appropriate time, and Outlook puts the pasted text into the Notes field, and then the user must copy it into the right field. In contrast, Citrine allows events to be much more easily copied and pasted into the Outlook calendar. Copying information in web forms can be tedious, since the provided paste operation will only take the first line of whatever is copied. Citrine adds new menu items to Internet Explorer to enable pasting of multiple pieces of information at the same time. Unlike IE and Google's autofill techniques that always paste the same information into each field, Citrine's paste in a form command fills the form with the current data that has been copied. This makes it particularly easy to paste addresses into MapQuest and Yahoo Maps, where you usually want new information every time. Note that for Yahoo Maps, Citrine has appended information for multiple items into the address field. For new web forms, Citrine allows you to train how to map the copied items into fields by showing by example which types of item go into each form field. The mappings are remembered for all future uses of the same form and any other forms that use the same field names. Many people use Excel spreadsheets to keep track of a variety of information. Citrine can be trained how to map each item into different columns. And then new copy data can be pasted into rows with a single operation. Note that this will work for multiple items at the same time. The Citrine dialer monitors the clipboard and will let users quickly dial a copied phone number and also any phone number in a copied contact. The dialing rules are learned from multiple examples. Citrine provides a viewer and an editor where the inferred information can be inspected and corrected if necessary. Taken together, Citrine's many features combine to provide significantly expanded functionality to users beyond normal copy and paste without requiring users to learn much in the way of new interaction techniques. A small formal user study so that people who are faster and like using Citrine compared to copying data items one at a time. And we have found Citrine to be very helpful and use it on a daily basis to help automate what otherwise would be tedious tasks. 
you can download Citrine software from my website. Okay. So that's the uh, the basic idea. Uh, hopefully the video wasn't too fast and that you've got uh, uh, a sense of uh, how things work. Um, so uh, just uh, to reiterate uh, a little more slowly, uh, basically the idea is you copy plain text. Uh, Citrine runs in the background, and whenever anything new appears on the clipboard, uh, it tries to run uh, its parsers on it, and it has a set of parsers that look for different kinds of information. If it detects one, uh, it changes the little icon in the tray and pops up a notification, uh, which you can turn off if you don't like them, but I find them pretty useful. Um, and then that adds new formats to the clipboard so that then you can go to a web form or whatever uh, and paste them all in one, uh, one operation. And then uh, if it's a form that it doesn't know how to uh, map the fields to, you can train it by example and remember that for all future uses of the form. Uh, so why is this cool? Uh, from a kind of a, uh, just from an application point of view, it's really nice. Uh, saves a lot of time. Uh, the people that uh, in my group and actually Don uh, San Giovanni says that he's downloaded it too, and we find it very useful on a daily basis for all sorts of stuff that we're copying. And and some people spend a lot of time copying and pasting from Excel to web forms and from plain text into different kinds of databases. And this uh, kind of helps you automate all those processes with a fairly uh, well understood kind of interaction technique that people already know. Yeah? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it does make mistakes. Um, and uh, we, uh, when you paste them into forms or whatever, then you can certainly go and edit them, uh, you know, in the destination, which is what you probably have to do anyway. Um, and uh, that's why, for example, when you pop it into Outlook, it leaves the form up, and then you can check all the fields uh, to make sure it did it right. And, you know, like uh, pretty much any of these recognizers are sometimes going to be wrong. There is a way to check what it's inferred in the middle, kind of, so that you can pop on the, you can click on the citrine icon, and it puts up this window that I showed in the video that uh, lets you confirm all the inferences uh, and edit them there. But most people don't bother. They just, you know, work on it in the destination rather than in the middle. Um, we did a little user study uh, that I mentioned in the video really quickly where we had people do it by hand, you know, copy and paste by hand, and they make more errors typically doing things by hand than our inferencing engine does uh, in, term, in the, you know, things that we tested. So uh, it's not like direct manipulation ends up being that accurate either. Yeah? So that we really carefully hand-tuned our recognizer for addresses, and that's, you know, really very good. It, it almost always does that right. On the other hand, our recognizer for bibliographic references really sucks, and so it frequently gets those wrong. And uh, for uh, events, it almost always gets the time and the place right and almost never gets the title right. And so one of the things that we hope to use this for is a way of kind of engaging our machine learning friends uh, across the hall uh, to try and improve some of these learn some of these parsers by learning, uh, by training, and you know different kinds of uh, techniques. So, uh, one of the things we haven't done that we could do is really push on the inferencing engines, the parsers, and so forth, because we know it's a well understood technique how to parse bibliographic references fairly reliably. Uh, so that's you know been in the literature for years, and we could certainly take those techniques and apply them. But we didn't do that because we really are looking at this not so much as a, a tool that we want to make wonderful by ourselves, but as a way to engage with some of the people working on this machine learning kind of stuff. But we, we did spend a fair amount of time on the uh, uh, on the parser for um, contacts, and, it, and it's uh, probably 99% accurate at this point. Um, and uh, so in terms of uh, usefulness, uh, you know, people don't need to learn a new interaction technique. They pretty much know how to use copy and paste. So we do have to add new write button menus to some applications. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it will be a good way to attach to other uh, techniques. So um, we've, uh, uh, you ha we have multiple parsers uh, for different kinds of things. Uh, you saw them demonstrated. Um, and some of them are pretty simple. 
Uh, the, the AI engine we're planning to use is called Minor Third at CMU. And uh, we also have recognized this for various structured formats. So if you copy something from the Palm desktop, uh, we will recognize the format and uh, generate the Outlook format from that so that you can copy things back and forth from structured things that you can't do now. If you happen to have multiple address books like I do, you'll discover that you can't really copy stuff out of the card scan address book and paste it in the Outlook if they're not compatible. And you end up doing it field by field anyway. But this solves that problem too by transforming all the formats uh, on the way. Uh, we're using currently an XML format to describe what we've uh, interpreted. And that's uh, you know part of the uh, process of making it so it can be compatible with other people's tools. So once this uh, XML format is uh, put onto the um, address, uh, onto the clipboard, then uh, we generate other formats from that and uh, add those to the clipboard. And because now, like the Palm address book format is on the clipboard, Palm will automatically, you know, enable its paste operation because otherwise it wouldn't be enabled. And so, therefore, that's why we don't have to modify Palm in order to make this uh, work. Um, uh, we have a little bit of feedback. There's a Cute, bunch of cute little icons that we've designed that show what type is conferred. Uh, there's this pop-up window, which I find pretty useful, but you know it's easy to turn off with a switch. Uh, and as uh, I mentioned just a second ago, if you want to edit the text in the middle, you know you can do that, or you can just wait and do it in the destination. Uh, and we have plugins for apps that don't uh, support our that don't that they don't have a copy and paste, like for events and so forth. Uh, but, of course, we prefer to just use, uh, you know, the built-in copy and paste mechanism where that's available. Uh, but you can use the right button menus to train uh, how to paste into Excel and IE uh, if you want to, uh, you know, do this uh, important. So I encourage you to download it. Um, uh, we're interested in using this as a vehicle for, you know, more intelligent parsing, for adding some of the features that we know are needed uh, to make it useful. But I think it's, you know, kind of cute even as it is. Anything else on Citrine before I go on? Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Squiggle. Citrine. Um, but if you, if you go to my personal website, uh, you can uh, also uh, navigate to it. Yeah. So one of the things that we don't support yet that John was just asking for, uh, and you know if he comes up with some money, maybe we'll do it quicker, um, is uh, you know training it on an Excel uh, database, you know Excel spreadsheet, so that you can quickly copy from Excel into uh, web forms, you know copy paste, copy paste, instead of having to do it field by field. Uh, okay. So the next one, I'm uh, next uh, project I want to talk about. Uh, it's a PhD research of my student, Andy Coe. Uh, it's very exciting work, I think. Uh, it's starting to get a little bit of publicity. And uh, we've been working for many years as part of the Natural Programming Project on making programming easier. And uh, we started a few years ago looking at the programming environment uh, issue. And the first thing we wanted to address was the debugging problem. Uh, and we found this uh, study from uh, NIST uh, from a couple years ago that said, of all programming activities, debugging is still a really crucial and time-consuming activity. And your average programmer spends 70 to 80 percent of their time uh, debugging, with the average bug taking uh, over 17 hours to fix per bug. Uh, and you know, you can think about in your own experience how much time you spend coding versus debugging. And uh, one of the focuses of our group is also on the issue of trying to get more people programming, trying to enable novice programmers and end-user programmers, people who don't want to be professional programmers but still need programming capabilities. And the problem of debugging is one of the key barriers to getting them uh, engaged and getting them to do stuff. Uh, but surprisingly, if you think about the advances in all of the areas of programming, what are we doing for debugging now? We're using print statements and breakpoints. Um, uh, watching variables, these were invented in the 1940s, okay? What has been new in debugging in the last uh, 60 years? Um, and people still, you know, are using print statements as their primary debugging tools in lots of environments. So I think we can do better. Hmm? Is, that, is that something you find in researching on people are still using print statements? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. What, what do you guys do? Well, I'm, I'm a part of the debugging team. Uh, oh, cool. Studio, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they watch. Oh, well, we can see what we have. But 
you know, they use watching variables, you know, and uh, but when you want to get some interesting uh, computation based on the uh, values, you know, print statements are still, or debug statements, right, where it comes out in the little window at the bottom, which is basically the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what our idea is, is to try and provide a new approach to debugging. And uh, just like in everything else that we do in the natural programming project, we started by doing lots of studies of people, uh, of actually what people do. And we studied people um, in a variety of uh, different situations. And we discovered that people uh, want to debug by asking questions to their program. Okay? Why did something happen? Why didn't something happen? That's what you're doing when you're debugging is trying to figure these things out. And uh, what we're trying to do with the Y line is let you ask the questions that people naturally want to ask in a natural way, directly of their code. And uh, we're, the prototype that you'll see that I'm going to demonstrate was aimed at novice programmers. Uh, it's been embedded in an environment for um, basically for kids. Uh, but we think that the techniques we're doing uh, will be really useful for professional programmers as well. And that's what we're doing now in terms of our research is, is trying to see how well it will uh, scale up. Um, so Y-Line is, of course, also an acronym, uh, and it stands for Workspace for Helping You Link Instructions to Numbers and Events. Uh, and it's part of Project Marmalade. Uh, there's a long story about why our, this is called Marmalade instead of, a, instead of a gemstone. And Marmalade, of course, is mechanisms that afford recurring mistakes in Alice by linking instructions to data and events. Uh, Alice is a programming environment that we're using, as I'll show you. And I've already told my student he has to change it because his next environment is not going to be built in Alice, so we're thinking about modifications. Uh, so next year, you know, it'll be the same project with a new acronym. Uh, and uh, it's part of the na natural programming project, which I've been working on for about eight years now, that really is trying to take this human-centered approach to the programming problem. So uh, as I mentioned, we did extensive studies. Uh, it was over 50 programmers, hundreds of hours of videotape that we analyzed of what they were doing when they were debugging. And we looked at expert programmers and beginners programmers. We did field studies and lab studies, okay? And so it was pretty broad range. And there's a surprising trend, surprisingly uh, consistency about what people are doing. And pretty much in every case, people were asking why did and why didn't questions of their code. Why did this happen? But surprisingly, almost 70% of the time, it was why didn't something happen? And today's debugging tools are particularly inappropriate for asking why didn't questions. You know, why wasn't this called? Well, you know, can't set a breakpoint on it if it wasn't called because it wasn't called. Um, and so, uh, you know, we set out to figure out a way of making these uh, why questions and why not questions particularly easy to ask to the code. And another thing that's very striking is that the questions, at least in the places we were studying, were not about the internals of the code. The questions were all about the output, the kind of end result. And that's where the people wanted to start asking their questions. You know, I expected this behavior, this output, this thing to move, this thing to disappear uh, in the uh, end result, and I didn't see it. Okay? And then from that, you have to track backwards into the internals of your code to figure out what happened. So things like, you know, why didn't my snowman disappear? Obviously, that was a, a graphical kind of thing. But it wasn't about, you know, why did this variable get the wrong value? You always wanted to start from kind of the uh, end result that uh, you were seeing. And, and that's you know, really what we tried to do. Another thing that if you kind of dig deep into what the people were doing, they were making assumptions about what their code was supposed to be doing or what their code was doing. And uh, often those were wrong. And a lot of times the question they asked uh, revealed that they were making false assumptions. Why didn't my snowman disappear? Well, it did dis disappear, but then it immediately reappeared. Or it did disappear, but you didn't notice because you were looking at it from the wrong perspective or, you know, things like that. So uh, another thing that's really striking, and this is a little tricky to explain, but in we counted all the bugs that we were ever put into the code. Half of those bugs were put into the code when the users thought they knew what the problem was, but they were wrong. And so they ended up fixing code that was already working uh, and added a new bug to it, okay? Because they didn't know where the real bug was, okay? So if we prevent them from making these wrong assumptions and being confused about where the real bug is, then they won't change this code that was already working and we might be able to eliminate half the bugs, okay? So I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, implications for this about correctness of code and about reliability and things like that, not just about efficiency of, of uh, programming. 
So the process that we go to is we allow people to ask these why and why not questions directly of their code. Uh, we try and reveal uh, false assumptions if they've made any that uh, result from uh, that. And then we give the answers directly in terms of the uh, elements of their program that they really care about. Okay, so that's another key aspect is to really highlight, you know, what is responsible for whatever it is that they're asking about. Um, and so uh, we call it the Y line. Uh, I'm sorry the video doesn't show up very well. Uh, this is the Alice programming environment that's uh, done by a colleague of mine, Randy Pouch at CMU. Uh, we looked uh, for quite a while at different programming environments to try and decide which one we wanted and decided that this one would be best uh, because, number one, we had the source code and we could add our new techniques to it. And number two, because of this drag and drop kind of editing that you see going on here, um, that uh, it makes it fairly easy for people in the lab setting to get quite a bit done. Okay, if we had them do Java, you know, how much could even a professional programmer get done in an hour? Uh, whereas with this drag and drop stuff, you can get, you know, a couple hundred lines of code done in an hour and it's probably going to be correct because of the, at least syntax errors, you can't make any. So the way this works is that over here are all the objects. And if you click on an object and here, you get all the properties, the methods, and uh, functions that the object will uh, operate on. And you can drag them into the code window. And down here, you can't quite see, are the con you know different operators like looping and conditionals and stuff like that. And uh, if a function has a parameter, then you can click on it, and it gives you all the other options for it. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward, direct inflation editor. Uh, it's fairly good for creating code and pretty awful for modifying code, just like pretty much all other structured, uh, structured programming environments. And what we added, what's new for the Y line is this button up here that says Y. Okay, uh, and then this window, the left side of which is a textual answer to the question that you asked with the Y button, and then over here is going to be a visualization uh, of the uh, of the result. The question menu contains both why and why didn't questions about the program's behavior, uh, and the questions are organized by objects. So first, you you click on why, and that pops up a submenu that says why did or why didn't. And then when you pick one of those, then you get all the objects in your program that did something or didn't do something. And then if you pick one, then it gives you a list of methods or, or parameters of that object that may or may not have changed. Um, so that's that one. The textual answer, there's a few different templates uh, that pop up uh, that uh, summarizes kind of the answer. And sometimes the textual answer is all that people need. Uh, in other cases, uh, you need to look at the timeline, and we did a lot of work on this timeline to try and visualize information uh, in a, an effective way, and it visualizes both the data flow and the control flow that lead up to whatever it is you asked about. So in this case, they said, you know, why did big dot is showing a change to false, and there was an if statement, and you can't see it here because of the projector, but there are lines that connect these uh, up, and uh, they're, uh, you know, both showing the data flow, uh, this says if, and so a true came into here, and this is a control flow. So it combines it all, all of the information you need to know about why that statement happened into one thing. And you can click on things in the Y line and explore further if you need more information. And there's also this scrub bar so you can go back and forth in time. Okay, so if you want to see earlier parts of the code, you can click on this and drag it backwards, and your program will execute backwards. Um, so let me, we're going to show you three examples. Uh, of the Y line in action, and these are taken from our actual lab user studies. Uh, they're actually, uh, th you know, situations that we saw people do. Okay, uh, so we didn't make these up. These are things that really happened, uh, and in fact, they happen more than once. So all the ones we I'm going to show you are, are examples that multiple people did the same uh, bug in, in various ways. So we had a very simple task: uh, make Pac-Man move. Uh, make Pac-Man shrink if he runs into the ghost, and make Pac-Man invincible if he eats the big dot before he eats the ghost. Familiar pass, uh, perfectly reasonable to do in five minutes in Alex. So here's the desired first behavior. Pac-Man should move. Okay, uh, pretty simple. Uh, and so here's somebody trying to construct that. Uh, they're going to take a pack and create a new method called uh, move pack. So here's the method. It's just been created. And... Uh, now they're going to uh, drag in the move, okay? And so they're going to say move forward uh, by three meters, okay? 
So now we've got this method, pack move forward three meters, looks like it's right. We'll run, and sure enough, pack is not moving. Okay? Who knows what the bug is? Anybody know? Huh? Okay. The, the, it's the wrong object. That's a good theory. There are all sorts of theories about what's happening. Maybe it's the wrong object. Maybe forward doesn't work. Okay? Uh, lots of people have theories about what was wrong. Yeah? <laughs> Maybe meters is not the right you know, thing. So uh, that's, uh, you know, these are scientists, so they know about meters. Right? So the real people had all these theories about what was wrong. And you can imagine that, you know, you'd spend a lot of time testing them. Uh, in fact, uh, most programmers, even the, even the professional programmers, you know, made this error and uh, spent two or three minutes fixing it. Uh, so let's go to the Y line now. Why didn't PAC move forward three? Okay, uh, and so uh, sure enough, um, it popped up the answer. Pack move forward three only happens when pack move pack happens, but there's nothing that makes pack move pack happen. So we have made this procedure, we just forgot to call it. Okay, so uh, you know that's something fairly easy to to uh, determine, um, and this is an example of what we call an invariant answer, uh, where there's nothing to show, and uh, sure enough. Uh, it takes, you know, 10 seconds to, to do that compared to two or three minutes, which is a savings of a factor of 15. Here's another task that shows a, a different problem. Uh, Pac-Man is supposed to shrink when he hits the dot. And uh, so we've generated some code here. So we put the move forward in a do together along with an if goes to in two meters of pack. Then I want to uh, resize him to zero. Then pack resize zero. Sounds like the right code. Okay, um, and sure enough, it doesn't work. And so again, the programmer is wondering why didn't that work? Maybe it wasn't close enough. It didn't really hit him. Maybe I couldn't see it hitting. Uh, maybe it, I wasn't supposed to use resize, you know. And it could take quite a while to figure out what's really the problem. And so let's use the Y line. Uh, why didn't pack resize zero? Okay, and this is a good example of a false assumption. Actually, pack resize zero did happen. Maybe it just didn't look like it happened, okay? So now we're going to say, well, wait a minute. If it did happen, how come it didn't look like it happened? And so we're going to use the, the timeline to see that, you know, right before and right after, PAC has the same size. Okay, so uh, this did operate, but it didn't seem to do anything in the window. Why might it not have done anything? Well, the Y line isn't going to answer that, but how would you explore that? Let's try typing in a different value for the parameter. And uh, we type in 0.5, and it turns out that's going to work. Uh, it turns out that resize, the function, has this weird property that if you say resize zero, it's a no-op. Okay? Well, you know, uh, that there are going to be operators like this in every language. You know, you don't understand the specification of this operator, uh, and so you, no one would expect this to have this property, you know, but this happens in C Sharp and every other language, that there are all these weird, you know, dependencies, and you never know what's going on. But this helped the programmer, say, uh, eliminate a whole bunch of possible other options about why this might have happened and what was going on. Um, and so it reduced uh, the time spent by a factor of 11 in our studies. Um, and here's a final example. Uh, this one's a little more complicated. What we want to have happen now is that if Pac-Man eats the big dot first, then he should be invincible. Okay, eventually we'll make the ghost disappear, but for the time being we'll make him invincible. So uh, we've added a little more code here. If bid dot is within one meter of pack, then bid dot set is showing the false. So we're taking that same code we used before and uh, making it for the big dot. And now we're going to change this uh, two meters of pack to be inside of a both, an and statement. But it didn't work. Okay. Uh, and so uh, now we're really confused. Uh, and you know this is more complicated code. Where could it be going wrong? There are all sorts of places where it might be going wrong. Uh, maybe the if then and else is wrong. Maybe I'm just, you know, completely confused and don't know what to do. Uh, maybe it didn't get into in time. Maybe in showing it's the wrong Boolean. So let's try uh, why did Pac-Man resize 0.5? And so the text says this is what caused it. Okay, so there's nothing really we can say in the text, but let's look at the timeline now. Um, Pac-Man is within two of Pac. Um, was, you know, so this is a test if both pack is on two meters and big dot is showing and both of them came up with values of true. 
and the true went into the end, which is still true, and that's why it happened. Okay, but these, this was not supposed to be true, so let's go and click on it and ask it why you are true. So we're uh, moving the timeline, and we see that that's, that's where the problem is. And so now we're going to click on this one and ask it about why it has the, the value it has. And, it's, and again, we have a false assumption. Actually, big data showing did change the false. And what we see is, uh, because we asked the question in the context of the other question, it adds the answers together. And what we're seeing is a really interesting multi-processing problem here. That, in fact, the test for big data showing is here, but the actual setting is here in time. And so the, the, uh, the uh, uh, different executions are interleaved. And uh, the test actually happens uh, in the wrong order. And so uh, we can, uh, you know, click around and see, see that happening um, and see the Boolean changing and how that actually, uh, you know, all plays out as we go back and forward in time of the execution. So uh, that, you know, really uh, makes it clearer. So now we know that what we have to do is take one of those Booleans and move it out of this uh, do-together loop so it's not in the same multiprocessing step, and now, and now it's going to work. Okay, so this is an example where, you know, visualizing the uh, control flow and the data flow together uh, really helps. Yeah. You said it was four to seven minutes before. How, how much did it take to visualize? Thirty seconds. Uh, so, you know, if you can ask this question directly, you know, uh, then uh, you can see the answers. And it's uh, this doesn't include the time to figure out what the fix is necessarily, but uh, at least. And it was only 30 seconds until I realized that there was this multiprocessing problem. Um, and so, uh, you know, naturally, uh, there's all sorts of uh, things you would assume if you're doing an if, if you're doing a set assignment, that that would be pretty quick. And that there's no reason why that would take longer than doing this long, complicated other thing. But just by the way that the scheduler works, it turned out to be done later. So what are we doing here? Um, there's two menus, the why didn't menu and the why did menu. The why didn't menu. It seems like there's an infinite number of things that didn't happen in this code, right? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that could have happened. But we found that it's only necessary in our studies to add questions to the why didn't menu that refers to things that might have happened. Because we're not dealing with ranked novices that think this is all magic and that anything in the world could happen. Uh, a real uh, programmer, even a beginner programmer, is only going to want to know about stuff they already wrote code about. So we go down all the branches of the if statements and go down the other branches. We, we go down all the events that didn't happen. Okay, so all the stuff that might plausibly have happened are all, what we put in the why didn't menu. And then we also, it turns out, because of the so many false assumptions, we had all the things that did happen to the why didn't menu. Okay, and that turns out to be really useful because people often find the question they want to ask in, the, in that menu. For the why did menu, we put uh, questions for each unique uh, execution of an output statement. But we found we don't have to put the stuff that didn't happen in the why did menu, just because uh, no one ever thinks, it seemed, it seemed in our case that no one ever asked about that kind of stuff. So we used a lab, uh, we did the lab study of this uh, programming uh, assignment, and we had half the programmers um, not use the Y line and half of them use the Y line. And um, we compared all the situations with where identical situations amongst all these programmers, of which there were about 24. And in about 80% of the time, the Y line directly answered the, the bug that people had. Uh, in the other cases, what happened was the programmers knew where the pro problem was, but not what to do about it. And these were all things like they had constructed a complicated Boolean, you know, and, or, not kind of thing, and they didn't know how to fix it because it was wrong. Uh, but it wasn't because they didn't know where the problem was. They just didn't know what to do about it. Um, so that's a pretty uh, good result. And in overall, average overall of people, it reduced the debugging time by about a factor of eight. And uh, a nice, you know, really productivity result is that they were able to get 40% further through the whole set of tasks when they had the white line. So it's showing that it really has an impact on how much code they can uh, gen generate and how correct the code would be. So what we're doing now, uh, kind of the obvious thing is saying, you know, does this scale up? And currently we're planning to make an environment for Java uh, because, you know, the Clips is a nice uh, customizable environment that we can get in and modify the debugging code, get into the runtime and find out all the information we need to know. Obviously, 
to implement this, we're keeping a complete history of everything that happens in the code, every variable assignment, every output statement, and so forth, in order to uh, generate this uh, Y line and to allow you to go backwards in code. Uh, you know, with modern computers, it doesn't make sense not to do this for almost any reasonable size program. Uh, you're going to have plenty of extra bandwidth, plenty of extra um, uh, memory in order to store the necessary information. But we really want to make sure that it'll work for uh, you know real size programs. And uh, so there's kind of two dimensions to scaling. You know, modern languages have many more different operators uh, and also much more complicated situations. So we want to make sure that uh, it will uh, work. And we're also working on constructing code. So not just debugging, but also how do you create code? What sort of uh, support can the environment provide that will be a, a major advance over what today's environments do? Okay. Any more questions about the white line? Well, right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the right button stuff does work now. You saw me do that in the Y line in one of the videos. That if you right button on something, you can ask Y questions about that. So you can do that on the object menu. You know, so the objects were shown on the left. You can say Y to this object. You don't have to go through the sub menus. And if you have a piece of code, you could say Y was this executed. Uh, or why wasn't this not executed, okay, which is basically all you can ask about code, or why did this get this value, which is pretty much the same thing. Um, and uh, so that's there. Uh, but what we find is that people, uh, you know, it's really nice to have a central place that people can go. They don't have to navigate because they're really confused about what happened and didn't happen, and that's why they want to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first two digits, are they used to any more? Yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, you know, there's some parts that we spent a lot of time on and some parts we didn't, and that was just kind of, we just did a print up without much thought about it. Um, but we don't really expect, the, the reason that the numbers are even there at all is the timeline turns out to be not linear in time because we wanted to make sure that there's a sufficiently long explanation of each of the blobs. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's probably pretty useless. I don't think anybody ever looks at the actual numbers there. But we, the reason we put them there is because you, most timelines are linear in time, and then we wouldn't be able to fit long enough uh, explanations on it. So we decided to go with nonlinear time. So that unless, you know, it, from any point to any other point, you kind of never know how long that takes. But for most things, it doesn't matter. I guess if you had something that was supposed to happen every 10 seconds or something, then you might say, you know, why was this 11 seconds or something? Uh, everything, everything really contributed, and it depended on the different kinds of, of questions. And what we saw a lot of times is that uh, if people were just, uh, you know, just by the fact of, uh, you know, going into the menu and pulling down, I don't know if you noticed, but as you're going from question to question, it's immediately scrolling the text and, and highlighting the particular code that answers that question. And often that's enough just to go to the Y button and say, why didn't those move forward three? And it highlights some code that's relevant to whatever the question was. And often that's enough to just kind of scroll around in the questions. Um, but so for some things like the multiprocessing question, you know, you really don't get the answer until you see uh, the interleaving of the code. So it depends on the... Um, well, the, pr the problem is that too much happens. And without the question, uh, we don't know what to display here. And we tried displaying everything, and there's just too much, and it's just completely unreadable. And so the neat thing about the question is it tells us what you're interested in in terms of what should be visualized. So even in this little environment, you know, there's still a lot of things that are happening, and you really, uh, it really is very difficult to show everything. Although that is the question. One of the questions you can ask from here is uh, what happened? And then it'll just show everything. Yeah. 
really a word that you've got her phrase. Can you really keep the, the, the big enough buffer to take this through the back of all the way? Well, you don't, have to, you don't have to get the assembly language instructions, right? We're just looking at the uh, instructions of this code. So, uh, yeah, it's not a problem. Um, that, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously the code runs slower when you're keeping all this stuff. But the uh, issue is, you know, and for this environment, it's not a bit of a problem. Whether it'll be a problem for a real environment like Java, uh, you know, we don't care about the garbage collector so much. We just really need to know about the high-level you know, method calls and so forth. So, uh, you know, we're really keeping things at a, the programmer's level, uh, which presumably don't happen nearly as fast as the assembly language level. Um, but we'll see uh, when we get to real size uh, systems. So let me go on. So I still have two more parts of the talk. Uh, the next uh, part I want to talk about is called EdgeWrite, uh, which is a new text entry method, and that's the PhD research of my student, Jacob Orbach, who was here uh, last summer as an intern. And the Initial motivation was to look at text entry by people who have muscular problems, like muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease, um, who have a, a difficult time making gestures. They can't do jot. They have a hard time with the tiny little keyboards that are on handheld devices. And so our initial idea was, wouldn't it be nice to provide some more stability for them? And our uh, initial implementation was to uh, take up a little plastic template, a piece of plastic, and put it over the text input area of the palm. And that makes a lot more sense on a palm than it does on a pocket PC because the text entry area is not a display area. So there's never anything there you have to click on, uh, except for the stuff in the four uh, holes because it's printed on the uh, silk screen so we know where they are. And so we can add holes in the text input area and that uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, on a pocket PC where that area is usually used for other things, uh, maybe that doesn't make quite as much sense. But we did some tests on the stylus version and discovered it's just as learnable as graffiti uh, or jot or any of those kind of things. Uh, it's about 20% more accurate uh, and about the same speed. A little bit slower maybe uh, for uh, normally able people. Uh, but you know, obviously significantly faster, significantly more effective for people who have disabilities. And so what we're doing now is looking at other input devices like uh, joysticks and uh, touchpads. Uh, so this is the alphabet, and one of the interesting things uh, to notice is that there's some loops here, okay, things like that. Those loops are not actually drawn, right? You just go down to the bottom of the square and then go across and back along the bottom of the uh, piece of plastic. Um, so, um, you know, here's one on a touchpad. So I'd go down and across and back along the bottom, and it's shown visualized as a loop there to give you a sense of how it's very much like the lowercase b letter, but uh, in fact, when you draw it, you're thinking of it as a loop, but in fact, you're drawing it as a straight line. And so you can see that all the letters, uh, you know, feel very much like the real uh, versions of the letters. Uh, because we have sides, we can differentiate the left and right side, which is harder to do in graffiti, so I and one are the same stroke. Way to go. Um, oh, and, uh, but they're on the opposite sides and so forth, so, you know, you can differentiate uh, things a little more easily. And also, we did a silly, a cute thing, I think. Uh, it turns out virtually no English letters end in the upper left, if you think about it. The way you normally draw, almost no letter ends in the upper left. And so we make it so that if you end in the upper left, that's a capitalization. So uh, if you draw a stroke like A, and then after you finish, you go to the upper left, that's capital A. Uh, so, uh, so you think, uh, you know, A up or something like that. And so, that avoids a prefix stroke that you have in graffiti and jot and stuff like that. So, um, and we, we do have a prefix stroke for punctuation, and that gets you, you know, all the weird characters. So uh, uh, that's uh, what we reported uh, last year here. Uh, we found that it's very highly guessable. There are lots of alternative forms for all of these, and I have the complete chart if you're interested in looking at it. So there are lots of different A's, a lot of different B's, uh, you know, and we tried to add all the things that people kind of normally do. So if you don't have a chart in front of you and you try something, usually, uh, you'll guess it. Uh, so uh, a new thing we've done this year is try EdgeWrite with a joystick, and we tried the game controller joystick, uh, like on an Xbox, only not the Xbox One specifically, uh, because we needed one that's mounted in a square hole, and the Xbox One is in a round hole. But we did find some commercial uh, joysticks that do have a square hole, and uh, that's one we use, the SciTech one. Uh, we also are interested in doing it on a cell phone, but we haven't done that yet. And another thing that we've done is the power, is a joystick on a power wheelchair. And so uh, the idea was that uh, for a touchpad, and I have that one here if you want to come try it, 
uh, we can use, it turns out it works perfectly well with the touchpad that's built into this laptop, but that's kind of a rectangle. So uh, we have a little plastic uh, insert that makes it work with a square. Um, and so you can do that with your finger. And uh, what we did, a uh, quick study, kind of a pilot study, and discovered that one thing that's really cool about this alphabet is you don't have to look. Okay, so that you can do it on the side, uh, you know, and you can feel the edges really well, and so it's completely irrelevant whether you're looking at the touchpad or not. Of course, it helps a little bit to look at the output. So if you're looking at what you're trying to, at the output, you can, you know, be a little more accurate, you know, if you see the right letters come up. But even so, you have a pretty good sense of whether you've done it correctly, kind of like with touch typing, and so you often don't have to uh, look at the output either in order to get fairly high accuracy. So. Uh, General Motors is funding this research, so they're kind of excited about this as a possible text entry method while driving. Although, uh, <laughs> not something I'm necessarily recommending, but, uh, you know, if you're going to do text entry while driving, you might as well have a technique because you don't have to look at it. Uh, so we did this study of text entry with a gamepad joystick, uh, and we compared it to the on-screen keyboard like an Xbox, as well as kind of the, what's called date stamp, where you uh, rotate through the letters, and we found that, uh, Edge right is indeed faster uh, with some practice, uh, but and the more you practice, the better you get. Uh, and uh, but you do make a lot more errors, which is not too surprising. But the the increase the uh, advantage in speed includes correcting these errors. So as you get better and you make fewer errors, uh, we think that this will be uh, significantly higher. So it it is a possible uh, uh, kind of technique, and these are with normally able people. But, yeah. Uh, word, yeah, words, words, and okay. so. So uh, our current work is to uh, look at the power wheelchair joystick, and so the idea is that people who are really significantly disabled, so that they need a power wheelchair, uh, they would use their joystick to power up to their computer, and then click a switch, and then the joystick that they're already using, that's already been adapted to whatever uh, abilities they have, then that joystick will switch from being uh, the wheelchair control to being their computer control. And you could use it both for mouse, con mouse control as well as a text input method. And so currently, what they usually do is uh, have their caregiver move their hands, because often they can't move their hands, onto uh, some other input device. Uh, and this would uh, alleviate that necessity. Um, and they currently have not had a technique for doing text entry from the joystick. They've only been able to do on-screen keyboards, like the selection keyboard we saw with the Xbox. And so the idea of the joystick one uh, is that uh, they can just use the same joystick and, uh, you know, do joy, uh, do um, uh, edge right, you know, or move the mouse or uh, uh, do the wheelchair all with the same joystick, yeah. You mean the wheelchair go little yeah, places? Right. No mode, well, uh, you know, these joysticks have lights on them. Uh, you know, you could show something on the screen to show it. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the big issues with any kind of work with people is, you know, reliability and safety and all this kind of stuff. So we certainly are uh, concerned about those issues and making sure that that's, uh, that's uh, taken care of. And we're collaborating with some people with, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh who deal with handicapped people a lot to make sure that all this is, uh, you know, going to be uh, very safe before we go any further. Yeah? Oh, that's, that's good to know. That's good to know, thanks. Um, and one thing that we found uh, in, in these testings is that the people's therapists will often customize their joysticks so that they're much more, uh, you know, effective for them, and so we might as well take advantage of that. And uh, sure enough, uh, you know, this worked out pretty well, and we're working on, uh, you know, different uh, techniques that will enable people to do it and, you know, investigating with more people and, and so forth. So this is uh, ongoing work. Um, we're also interested in more refinements for the non-disabled, uh, for the normally able people, uh, as I mentioned, used in automobiles, maybe with tiny devices like a key fob or something like that. You could use the text entry method or the joystick on a cell phone. All those are interesting uh, areas for future work.
Yeah. Can you go back to that previous one side? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's edge right. You know, you're writing along the edges. Yeah, it's not going to matter. Really? It tries to resolve it. It's a little bit like two. Oh. Well, sometimes the CMA site is uh, it is, not responsive. Yeah. Well, the two is uh, is this automatically forward website, so that's fine. Either one will work. And the final part, uh, it's fine for you guys to leave because I've reported this a million times. Um, and this is the uh, the Pebble software that uh, that Microsoft has been funding for a number of years. Uh, and I just wanted to give a quick update. Um, it's not too much new. Uh, basically, the idea of Pebbles, for those of you who don't know, is to investigate how handhelds can augment normal computers uh, instead of being a replacement for them. So the assumption is that in most environments, you actually have a handheld as well as another computer in your office, in your car. The car is full of computers in your home. All of your appliances have computers in them uh, in a meeting room like this. You know. So how can these be an augmentation to the regular computers that are in your environment? And we've built a large set of applications uh, and research topics. We have about 40 publications that have resulted from this that are all on the website. Uh, we have a new version of the software that's available for downloading, and the URL will be at the end of the talk. Um, so the Slideshow Commander is this uh, program I'm running now. Uh, it has a lot of different capabilities. Um, and there's a new release which has the John San Giovanni uh, feature, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but basically, uh, one thing you can do is draw right on the screen by drawing on your handheld. Um, and it's easy to erase. Um, you can, uh, uh, can easily go forwards and backwards uh, just by uh, clicking the arrow keys. Uh, and um, if you want to jump to a particular side, there's a list of titles. So if you said, you know, remember back on slide three, you said something, and then I can just click on, well, that's like, that, um, here's slide three. Um, and then I can go back to where I was. Um, and, um, you know, because I have the list of titles um, in my hand. Uh, another thing that people are doing these days a lot uh, is uh, having media in their talks. And so uh, if I switch modes, there's this little button up here. And if I switch modes, then when I tap on things, it taps on them. And then I can uh, start media playing. and. Uh, you know, play sound effect. You know, and if I have a hyperlink in my talk, I can just click on it, and that'll uh, you know spend 20 minutes uh, ringing up IE. And uh, you know, uh, so, but the idea is that's a whole lot easier than trying to do it uh, with a pointing stick uh, as you're uh, kind of uh, moving around. Uh, so that's. Uh, uh, you know, some of the features. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a list of applications. So if you want to give a demo in the middle of your talk and you click on uh, this button here, you get basically the taskbar. And so I can just uh, click on uh, an application. It'll bring it to the front. And then when I'm done with it, I can just uh, go back and write to my talk without a lot of fooling around. Um, we have a preview. So if I use the physical buttons on the uh, PDA, then I can see the next slide and the previous slide. Um, so I can see, you know, what was I going to say next? And if I want to, I can jump a few slides ahead uh, or I can cancel. And then the John San Giovanni feature um, is that there's a, a button now that will always show on your handheld the next slide. So it'll keep a slide ahead of where you are. So John says that would be cool. I think it would be confusing. But we added it in. And uh, so you can give me feedback on whether it turns out to be good in practice or not or just confusing. And if you do that, then the picture you see on your handheld is always the next slide from the one that's on the main screen. Um, and so that's in the, uh, the release. Whoops. Uh, there's another application called Shortcutter, where you build little panels of controls on your handheld. It's kind of like Visual Basic. Uh, but what these buttons do is do stuff on your PC instead of doing stuff on your handheld. And so uh, for example, you can use it for scrolling. Uh, you can use it for uh, controlling media players, uh, which is one thing that a lot of people use it for, and so forth. And then finally, uh, there's a personal universal controller, which is Jeff Nichols' research work, to look at remote control of real appliances. And the idea is that your real appliance will send a specification of what it does to your handheld, which will generate a control panel automatically. And then you can control it, but you also get feedback about the state. And uh, this, we've reported this a lot here. Uh, and I gave a demo of it in the uh, demo fest at uh, the faculty summit. 
and it's implemented in C sharp, and it runs on the phone as well as on the pocket PC as well as on the desktop. And it generates, you know, high quality user interfaces automatically from the specification of what the appliance can do. Um, and what we're going to do next, which I think is real exciting, is look at this issue of consistency. So since it's automatically generating in interfaces, it should generate them so that they're always the same for the user. So the idea is that any time you want to set the time on something, you set it the same way. So whether it's on your alarm clock at home or in your car or on your VCR, what time you want to start recording, okay, all of those times you should be able to set it the same way. And uh, also what we call controlling user experiences. You have a whole set of appliances in the room and you want to have them all work uh, uh, together. So uh, the idea is that you could have a button that says play DVD and you'll know how to turn on the DVD and turn your TV to the third uh, input and turn on your stereo system and all this will work together. And furthermore, that'll be all done automatically. You won't have to program this complicated macro by hand. Uh, so there's lots of papers about all this stuff, of course. Uh, you might want to write down this URL if you want to download the software because we don't have a link to it yet. Um, but it's, uh, it's where you can get the version 6 software now. And uh, we're not, uh, we're going to release it real soon now, but we have to do a little more testing. Uh, Slideshow Commander that I'm using on the, for PowerPoint has been licensed for commercial sale. And so that's not, you won't even be able to find that from here, but if you go to the private website, then Microsoft employees should be able to download that for free since you guys helped fund the research that uh, funded it. So if you're interested in this, and uh, I can go back to the URL. I want to thank all the sponsors that we've had. Uh, obviously, Microsoft's on the list. I hope you'll continue to be there. Um, and move up, even. Um, this is sorted by, you know, amount of money. Um, and uh, we've gotten lots of uh, support from equipment manufacturers for a lot of this research, too. And uh, lots of students have participated in this. Probably 40 different students have done different parts of the uh, work that you've seen. Um, and uh, it's been a really effective collaboration. And thank you for coming in and staying late. Anybody have questions about the devil's part? Or? That's right. Sure, that's good there. Okay. Uh, great. So I also wanted to add some comments. Uh, so Brad has been an awesome, awesome collaborator for many, many years. And as you can see, uh, he manages a wild diversity of projects. In fact, uh, I'm incredibly impressed that he's able to cover as many different topics as he was in a limited amount of time. And I convinced him that that's kind of the way that Microsoft people think anyway, so I think it worked very well. But and you, as you can see, in addition to managing a wide range of projects, he also manages a, a small army of developers and, uh, and graduate students who all do exceptional work. The quality of, in, of his engineering is amazing. The, the reason why I want to mention this is because there's a wide range of his, uh, of his research, especially now, is a little bit outside of the charter of my um, research support area, which is mobile computing uh, technologies. So for those of you who are watching online or for those of you who are here representing product groups, for example, the, the Y-Line work I think is very relevant and appropriate to the, uh, to the research that's happening in the Visual Studio group and beyond, uh, as well as program and productivity, et cetera. So there's lots of great opportunities for collaboration. Ben is always a, a, a really great collaborator and actually uh, is interested in, in uh, deepening our relationship and uh, it's very open to things like intellectual property licensing, et cetera. So I want to mention that if you're interested in uh, pursuing those types of relationships and setting aside some budget to pursue these in a more specific way, I encourage you to email me, John Sang, J-O-H-N-S-A-N-G, uh, to find out more about these types of partnerships. Uh, Brad's got a pretty action-packed schedule during which the time he's going to be uh, meeting with uh, different teams who have appropriate um, uh, engagement, cut and paste in Windows, and and some of the developer groups here. And so, if you'd like to uh, to meet with Brad, please also send me an email, and we can see if we can line up one of those meetings in one of the very small slots that are available for him. Uh, so now, I think we can take some Q and A. If there's some additional uh, questions. No. If not, thank you. Very much. Okay. Oh, they're incredibly open uh, to new ideas. Uh, we found uh, that uh, we made contact with the local cerebral palsy organization in Pittsburgh, and they have, you know, 20, 30 people who come every day to the cerebral palsy center, 
who are really excited about anything that we can provide that uh, may be useful for them. Uh, they're really willing to try stuff, uh, to uh, you know, give us as much time as we need uh, to experiment with things, to try stuff in early phases. And uh, so it's been uh, very gratifying uh, in terms of, and they're they're so needy that you know there's so much that they want to do that they can't do now that uh, it's really not, you know, if you pay a little attention to them, it's really easy to find things that you can help them with that really is uh, effective. Um, and then in terms of publishing, you know, they have the assets concept. Uh, um, conference is a ACM uh, conference, which is uh, you know very well respected in this community. As well as there's a practitioner conference called Resna, uh, where uh, people present this kind of stuff, and you know all the all and it's so much easier actually than this community of getting things into practice because this Resna conference, the researchers go and present stuff, and it's full of um, therapists. The therapists actually go to this conference, and they're just dying for new ideas and new things to try out. Um, one thing we have found is they're not very interested in research prototypes. And the, the, the therapists don't want to have to support this stuff, right? They're not programmers. Uh, if, you, if you have a little company that's you know, willing to provide some support or you can license it, uh, then they're really excited. Uh, but they're not so much, there's a few people who are willing to download stuff and install it themselves and send you bug reports and stuff like that. But, uh, if you're going to support it yourself, you know, with local people, that works out really well. Uh, and if you can find a little company or a big company uh, to support it, uh, then the therapists are just really excited to try it right away. Uh, so, yeah, that's been very, pretty easy and very gratifying. The real trick uh, with it is the enormous individual differences that you can't generalize like you can with normal user interfaces. That, you know, anything that works for one person is is great, but it's unlikely to work for the second person. And uh, so you have to have all sorts of controls and knobs and stuff in your software so that the therapists and the individual users. And also, even over time, individuals like uh, fatigue enormously. And so something they can use for 15 minutes, they might not be able to use for an hour. And uh, so that actually, you know, if you show that your system is 30% slower than a keyboard, they might say, great, uh, because they can use the keyboard for 15 minutes and then they're tired and then they need to use a different muscle group uh, in order to you know, keep using the computer or else they have to give up and take a nap and come back later. So uh, you know, that's the real challenge. Is it's really hard to write a kite paper because you can't get statistical significance because anytime you do something, it changes in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we wrote an article. We had a nice article in CNN.com about the Y line, and somebody wrote, you know, a comment on it and said, oh, that's ridiculous. Debugging is so much better today than it was 10 years ago. And it's like, well, you know, you might have Visual Studio now, but in the 70s, I had Interlisp, which had all the same features as Visual Studio does now. Uh, you know, maybe you didn't have it, but, uh, you know, some people had it, and it's not like there are a lot of new ideas there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really so surprising to me and discouraging how little has changed for programmers compared to what's changed for, you know, end users. I think a Nobody ever about That's why compilers get away with doing disgusting I'll let that be your comment. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And especially the touchpad version, um, you know, might be appropriate. And uh, this is the off-the-shelf Synaptics uh, uh, touchpad with a little piece of plastic on it. Uh, and you can do it with your finger, and it plugs right into Windows without any trouble. Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, the touchpad version or the joystick version. Um, the problem with joysticks is they're, the ones we found have fairly strong springs. Uh, and so it tends to be tiring after a while. Well, that would be great. You know, if we could get connected up with a group that can do, um, well, no, it's, it's really more complicated than that, you know. 
they can do the uh, hardware engineering to uh, explore the different dimensions of you know, how far the stick moves and how springy the spring is and how big the knob is on top, uh, you know, whether you hold it like this or whether you hold it like this or you hold it like this with your fingers. You know, all those have a really big impact on the uh, fatigue factor, how fast it is, uh, all these kind of things. And uh, we really need to connect up with some group that can do that engineering for us. Oh, yeah. yeah. And if you go to the EdgeWrite website, I think that software is there. But if not, then, yeah, we have that. It's, it's yeah, actually, can you talk a little bit? I think that's another really cool thing that, that you and Jake have done in this last year is this incredible tool for text input analysis. Oh, yeah. Which is what I use now for XNAND. It's really a cool tool. And in fact, it's a whole, um, it's a whole uh, way of evaluating text input systems the most sophisticated with XNAND. Um, done in collaboration with Scott McKenzie. Well, not really, but oh. it's based on his work. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, if you have a text input technique, we have a way of analyzing the speed and accuracy. Uh, and it's a pretty narrow interest to people who are developing text input techniques, but uh, I think it's a pretty cool uh, small result. Yeah? Yeah, there is a mouth input device that we found a website for and that we are trying to get. But there, it turns out they're all custom made uh, for each individual and they're really, really expensive. So it was very hard. They, they weren't a bit interested in giving us a prototype device. I mean, how, you know, that sounds really gross. Right? How would you do a user test on five people with an in-mouth device? But uh, yeah, I think we're really excited about trying this alphabet in lots of different situations with um, mouth joysticks with, uh, and you could, you know, with uh, uh, Ryan stuff, you could do it in the air, you know, without the box, but you could just kind of measure it, and probably the same thing with neck, if you have the neck muscles, uh, you just kind of imagine the box and try and do it that way. It might be faster than trying to select things from an on-screen keyboard or things like that, because you don't have to dwell in order to terminate the strokes, uh, which most of them have to do now. So, uh, you know, I think it'd be great to get some collaborators or other uh, hardware that we could try it out on other people. Yeah. Yeah. They, I think one of the real compelling things about it is that it's learnable because it seems like the alphabetic strokes. That, that would go away. And uh, if you had four kind of arbitrary buttons, you could just encode it in ASCII, you know, and people could do the four buttons with, you know, four times two is, you know, two to the fourth. If, if, if you had them in space anyway. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's something we've considered, you know, all sorts of different arrangements and so forth. We also need a segmentation signal. Yeah. Right. Well, the the tongue one has uh, yeah it does have four buttons or has I think it's eight buttons the one I'm familiar with that you can feel with your tongue. So even though it's not an edge, you still feel the buttons uh, you know in, in a way. So that there there are lots of different form factors that would be really fun to explore. Yeah. If you yeah, remember, I mean, there's lots and lots of uh, text entry methods, some of which may be a lot faster than right but they're very hard to learn. And uh, so it may not be slower. I mean, Morse code can go pretty quick, but you have to memorize these completely arbitrary se uh, sequences. Uh, and, you know, I've been sent or reviewed papers of these weird input devices where you, you know, encode ASCII in chords, you know. And, you know, sure enough, with four bits, you can get most of ASCII, right? And, uh, or five bits anyway. And uh, so, you know, does that make sense? Well, no one's going to learn it. And uh, the original Unistrokes alphabet that uh, Xerox Park invented, you know, just assigned strokes in arbitrary directions to the different characters. 
uh, it was really easy to recognize, very quick, much quicker than Edgewright, uh, but no one would, could learn it. So I think there's a lot of uh, advantage to having the strokes be really compellingly like the uh, English strokes. So uh, we do have time. I do have a few slots on my schedule if there's some groups that would like to talk about this at a little more length, or else you can certainly contact me. Yeah? Uh, that's released now. Uh, we're happy to just let you use it. Uh, we decided not to try and get any intellectual property uh, protection on that. Uh, it seems like um, all of the really hard work is in the recognizers. Well, all the really hard engineering work is hacking it into all these apps, but that's generally not anything really important. Um, the recognizers really need to, you know, more work in order to get them uh, to work really well. Uh, but uh, yeah, if, if Microsoft wanted to, to use that right now, uh, we'd be delighted to have you just pick it up and take it. Especially if you wrote me a letter and said that, then they could use it on my, you know, on my website, for my student promotion and stuff. But, um, but yeah, Citrine is not protected. Some of the other stuff is, uh, but Citrine would be delighted if you guys picked up right away. And the software is all downloadable. Great, thanks.